So I don't, I don't, oh, hi. <laughs> so I don't like to stand behind lecterns because they're, um, you can't see me if I do that. So, um, thanks. Um, <laughs> so hands up if you've heard of or are a fan of the Marvel Avengers. Okay, some hands, go, that's good, some hands going up. This is a talk that's designed for people who haven't heard of Marvel's Avengers also. Um, every year, uh, my friend Jeff and I, who co-founded HD Buzz, do an update in the summer at the, H the Huntington's Disease Society of America convention. And every year, they say, can you change it up a little bit? Because they're American. Can you change it up a little bit? You, maybe a different format? So every year, it's the same talk. Like, we give a research update, and everyone's there to hear about the science, but the HDSA always wants us to put it in a new, like, framework every year. So this year, it's the Marvel Avengers, because this movie, uh, Avengers Endgame, came out in the cinemas. And actually, I had to, we, we chose this as the title of our talk before either of us had seen the movie. But it works quite well. So I'll talk you through it. Um, and it's, I've updated it since I gave the first talk in, Ju in June. So who's this? Anyone? Thanos. People, some people know. You may have to explain it to the other people on your table. So Thanos. Uh, is from the planet Titan. Uh, he's also known as the Mad Titan. So Thanos is the big baddie of the Marvel Avengers cinematic universe. This is going to be about Huntington's disease very soon. Don't worry. Um, so Thanos is the big baddie. Basically, he's decided that he wants to kill 50% of all life in the universe. 50%. That starts to sound familiar. And anyway, at the end of the uh, previous movie, which was called um, Avengers Infinity War, he snaps his fingers and 50% of all of the people die. So it's really depressing. And it's bad for the people who die. And it's also really bad for the people who are left behind and who are powerless to do anything about it. Uh, and if that sounds familiar, it's probably because of the thing that brought us all into this room. So that's the end of the previous movie. This is Thanos. And the, the reason he's able to do this is because he has immense power, because he has collected from the far corners of the universe these six things called infinity stones, and he holds them in the infinity gauntlet, and that is how he is so powerful. And at the end of the previous movie, he's, he's basically won. But there's another movie. <laughs> so the... And, and the final movie is called Avengers Endgame. And the heroes of the Avengers Endgame movie have to travel, spoiler alert, have to travel back in time to collect the six Infinity Stones before Thanos can get his hands on them. So then all of that power is in the hands of the good guys, and they can prevent Thanos from killing 50% of everyone. And that, these are their names. They're six different colors, and they have names space, mind, reality, power, time, and soul. OK, so that's the background. And this, of course, is Dr. Strange, an extra point for knowing his first name. Benedict Cumberbatch, as you say. Can't pronounce the word penguin. Um, yes, and it, so he says, we're in the end game now. Uh, because he can see the future. Now, I can't see the future, and I doubt any of you guys can, which is why my talk has this question mark. Because we actually don't know whether we're in the end game of Huntington's disease. But I do feel like we're at the, at, the, at the point between those two movies, where this thing has been doing this harm for a long time, and for the first time, we can see a way to actually fix that and do something about it and take control of all of that power. And here's how we're going to do it. So in the movies, it's these, the Avengers, which is this large group of people, heroes, superheroes. Some of them are human. Some of them are aliens. Um, anyway, it's a good movie. Uh, I think that the, all of the Huntington's disease research and, and how we're going to triumph over Huntington's disease can be boiled down to these six infinity stones. Do you believe me? Well, let's find out. So this is the first of the stones. It's the purple one, which is the power stone. You guys are awesome. The power stone. And the power stone gives its user or bearer huge power. And I think that our 
power stone is science, the, the existence of science and how science does stuff. It gives us the power to turn impossible things into possible things. And the reason we know that in Huntington's disease is because we've seen it happen several times already. So in 1992, nobody knew what the cause of Huntington's disease was. And then this paper came out in Cell, a journal, and from that day, we knew what the cause of every single case of Huntington's disease was. And that wasn't just scientists that did that, it was scientists working in partnership with thousands of HD family members from across the world, Venezuela, the US, and Europe, to, who they, the, Families donated their DNA samples and the scientists worked hard to find the Huntington's disease gene. And from that day, the impossible task of discovering the cause of Huntington's disease was suddenly possible. It was a piece of information that we had. And from that day, we were able to start working on things like finding out what that gene does and developing animal models of Huntington's disease that have the same mistake in the gene. Um, it was over 12,000 family members and what they discovered was that the gene is a recipe for a protein, a set of instructions for making a protein, this protein, which is called hunting tin. And when um, there are 35 or less, fewer, in fact, CAG repeats in that gene, you get the normal one. If there's more than 36, 36 or more, you get the mutant Huntington protein. And that protein basically gums up all of the machinery in your neurons. The brain is really good at surviving and dealing with the effects of that, but in someone who has the mutation, it becomes too much and the neurons start to die more quickly than they are supposed to. Um, what, so that's bad news, but it's good news that we know it. And we've known it for 26 years. And in, in that time, what we've been discovering, or in fact inventing, is ways to stop that gene from causing the harm that it causes. There's one extra piece of information you need, which is that in between the gene, and, which is the recipe, and the protein, which is the end product, is this middle step it's called mRNA, the messenger molecule. It's a bit like DNA, but it only has one strand. So the gene is sort of photocopied into this single strand, and it's that single strand that is then used time and time again to make the protein. Make sense? So there's this idea which, Sometimes it's called gene silencing. Um, we call it Huntington lowering or protein lowering. And basically the idea is that you can make a drug that sticks to this message molecule. And um, when you do that, the cell finds this molecule with something stuck to it and says, that's not normal, that shouldn't be there, I'm going to delete that. And that's what happens. It, the drug is just a, like acting like a label. It's the cell that's actually doing the deleting. And when you get rid of that messenger molecule, much less of the protein is made. Uh, and the hope is that uh, applying this technology to Huntington's disease uh, will make a difference. Um, it seemed impossible when it was first suggested in the late 90s. It was first done in mice in 2005. It took another 10 years before the first of these Huntington lowering drugs was given to a human being. This is that injection happening. This is the first ever dose of uh, this gene silencing drug. It's called an antisense oligonucleotide, or ASO. Long name, don't need to know it. The drug was called HTTRX at the time, and it was developed by Ionis Pharmaceuticals. This is the first syringe full of drug, and this is the love handle. She gave me permission to call it that, by the way. Written permission. This is the love handle of the first patient um, who is still receiving injections of that drug every couple of months. And this is a very stressed me uh, worrying that this patient's brain is about to explode. <laughs> it didn't. It was a stressful week, though. It took two and a half years for the results of that to come out. So that was the first trial. That was the big news story. It was December the 11th, 2017. It was the day Keith Chegwin died. And there was a lot of snow. But despite those two big events, this was the lead story on the BBC News at 10. Hands up if you remember that. Sarah Tabrizi was on the news. I was on the news giving a fake injection to a fake patient. It was like the polar bears all over again. Um, remember when the BBC got in trouble for, making, for faking a polar bear nest? Well, that injection was fake. 
Anyway, it was good news. And that, they still use that footage now. Whenever someone new drug is happening, I think there's like a, an archive at the BBC, and it says, whenever someone searches clinical trial, they get footage of me and Lauren Byrne from Belfast giving a fake injection to a fake patient. Anyway, these were the results that shook the Huntington's disease world. Basically, we tested five different doses of the drug, 10, 30, 60, 90, and 120 milligrams. If the Huntington protein level, oh, and these are the placebo. So these are people who got injections of basically nothing. The, if the level didn't change, it stays here. If it went up, it goes here. If it went down, it goes here. And each patient is one circle. So the placebo people stayed roughly the same. And with each successive dose, 90 and 120 ended up about the same because of this one person who behaved slightly strangely. But basically, the more drug you give, the lower the protein ended up at the end of the trial. And we call that a dose-response relationship. Essentially, what that means is not only did the drug not kill people, which it could have done, not only did the drug lower the Huntington protein, which is a complete home run, it also did it in a dose-dependent way, which means we have a volume control knob for the Huntington protein. If we want to turn it down a lot, we can do that. If we want to turn it down a little, we can do that too. So this is the same result, but just showing a lot more data from each patient. So the placebo people just sort of muddled around at the same dose. And then with each increasing dose, and you can see in the 120 milligram dose, you've got this lovely ski slope uh, where their protein is just being shushed quite beautifully, I think. So a patient of mine who is an actor said to me in clinic a few months later, what does this mean? And we've been talking about movies. I'm a fan of uh, science fiction films. So the, of course, the first thing that sprang to mind was this movie, which is Predator starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. And in the, so this is a group of soldiers that are being um, uh, stalked by this really evil alien enemy. And, half, uh, and, and it kills everyone it comes into contact with. But then halfway through the movie, they see it in the forest, and they all fire their machine guns into the trees. And they think the monster has escaped. But then they look down, and they see this fluorescent liquid on the leaves of the tree. And it turns out that this is the blood of the enemy that they've been stalking. And Arnie turns to the camera and says, if it bleeds, we can kill it. <laughs> Which I think is what we did with that trial in Huntington's disease. We didn't kill it. What, what we've shown is that for the first time, this is an enemy that can be injured. We can do something to stop the inexorable march of this foe. Um, Arnie, when he says this, he doesn't know that they're going to kill it, although, once again, spoiler alert, they do. It's from the 1980s, so it's not that much of a spoiler. Um, they do kill it, but what he's doing is he's looking at the evidence that's been presented, and he has a new belief that this is an enemy that can be defeated. And I think that is what that trial accomplished for the HD community. So uh, where we are now, it's two years later, where we are now is that we, from based largely on that trial and the, the 46 people who were in it have been receiving regular injections of the drug in an, what's called an open label extension. Um, we know that the drug is safe enough to keep giving to people, that it lowers the Huntington protein in a pretty awesome way and we don't know whether it slows progression of Huntington's disease. Why don't we know that four years after the trial started? It's because Huntington's disease is very different from one person to the next. You know this. And it's also very variable. So some people uh, progress quickly. Some people progress slowly. People can be perfectly fine one day, bad the next day, and then right as rain the day after. All of that makes it a very complicated disease to study. Um, and what that means is that you know, if you're dealing with motor neuron disease or cancer where people die within two years after getting the symptoms, you can run short trials because people are changing slowly and changing quite predictably. In Huntington's disease, you have to run much longer trials involving lots more people. Uh, and you have to compare active treatment to placebo because being in a study as exciting as this comes with a big placebo effect. It's only when you run those big trials that you discover whether the drug is actually slowing progression. So the news so far is as good as it possibly could have been, bearing in mind what we know about Huntington's disease, but we're not there yet. That's where this new study, Generation HD1, comes in. This is called a phase three efficacy trial. The phase three trial is where you say, right, we're gonna go for gold, we're gonna try and get this drug licensed for prescribing by doctors, 
that means we're going to run a big trial basically to answer the question, yes or no, does this drug slow the progression of Huntington's disease? So it's enrolling 660 people at dozens and dozens of sites across the world. They all have early Huntington's disease symptoms, and each person is in the trial for two years. And when it was first unveiled in January 2018, um, and actually recruitment started in January 2019 using this design, each person was going to receive 25 injections of the drug or placebo into the spine over two years. One drug a month for two years and then an extra one. So 25 injections. There was a two-monthly arm, which was uh, the same number of injections, but it was drug, placebo, drug, placebo. And then the placebo people were going to get 25 injections of nothing. But thanks to the 46 people who gave us that first result, remember I said they'd all carried on giving us um, information by continuing to receive injections of the drug. What that showed was that if you give the drug every month, you get down to about 55% Huntington lowering. But if you give the drug every two months, you still manage to get down to somewhere between 45 and 50%. What that tells us is that we, we don't need to give the drug every month. We can just go for two monthly dosing. So the trial was redesigned just a couple of months after it started enrolling to switch it from monthly to monthly and placebo to, so the monthly arm was gone. The two monthly arm now is drug, nothing, drug, nothing. Placebo is injections every two months. And then there's a four monthly arm, which is drug, placebo, drug, placebo every two months. So it's half the number of injections that's really good news, and it means that there's, the trial is much less likely to suffer from things like people dropping out because of too many injections. So that's really good news for everyone. So that um, trial started enrolling again in, like, I think May of this year. Uh, four months later, uh, last week, we heard sort of through unofficial channels, but it's public, that in the USA, the trial is fully recruited. And in outside the USA, recruitment is still happening, but it is very close to being fully recruited. And honestly, this is the first time that Rush has done a Huntington's disease trial of this size. But the people at Rush are telling me that, they're, that it's one of the fastest trials they've ever recruited. And Rush has run hundreds of phase three trials before. So the HD community has really knocked it out of the park when it comes to signing up for this really important trial. It's not fully recruited yet, but it's going to be recruited, and it will deliver its answer in record time, I think, one way or another. That is not the only trial of a Huntington-lowering drug that is even happening now. So um, there's another trial happening run by a company called Wave Life Sciences. You'll remember um, that uh, every, person of the H every person with the HD mutation has two copies of the gene. One of them is a recipe for the bad protein. The other is a recipe for a harmful, uh, sorry, a harmless or even helpful protein, wild type Huntington. It's not named after me. Um, thank you. So uh, the Wave Life Sciences drug does more or less the same thing, but through s some genetic trickery is aiming to just reduce production of the mutant protein while leaving this one um, muddling around to do its thing. So these are the Precision HD1 and Precision HD2 trials. That's a much smaller trial, and that trial is at the stage that the other trial was at in 2015. Well, maybe 2016. So we're hoping that this trial will read out at some point towards the end of this year. That's what we've been led to expect anyway. Um, it's really good that both of these strategies are being tried in parallel. This one's happening in the UK at two sites, uh, Glasgow and Exeter. Um, but most of the sites are in the US for this one. So that is a glimpse into the, the impossible things that the power stone of science has made possible. Oh, yes, I haven't forgotten the Avengers thing. We're going to talk about all six of the Infinity Stones, and that was only the first one. I better speed up. Um, so that's science. And uh, Huntington lowering is very much the big thing in HD. Um, where are we now? So what's this stone, the blue one? This one, it's, I always get confused between the blue and the purple. It is, of course, the space stone. So this... Uh, is a reflection of the fact that we need to find new ways of treating the brain. The problem with the human brain that we face in HD is that it's huge. And these ASO drugs injected into the spine 
may not reach the deep parts of the brain uh, that are affected in Huntington's disease as well as we need them to. It would also be pretty awesome if we could just have a treatment that you only have to take once, like a vaccine or something, which protects you for the rest of your life. And that's what these new virally delivered gene therapies are aiming to do. So the basic aim is still the same. We want to get rid of this protein. But the approach is slightly different. What you do is you take a virus, that's this hexagonal thing here, and you put a, a set of instructions inside it for making a gene silencing drug. You then inject it into the brain where it infects the brain cells and turns the brain cells, the neurons, into a factory for making the drug. So each of your neurons now has this extra bit of DNA floating around, which is then a recipe for making a silencing drug. So it's constantly manufacturing this drug. It doesn't have to be in, uh, given lots and lots of times. The drug then does the same thing. It sticks to the message molecule, and that's deleted, and that causes the protein to be formed much less. The, uh, there are a lot of companies trying this because it's really appealing to be able to um, treat the brain in this way. It, it, it's not necessarily a walk in the park, though, because you have to inject these drugs directly into the brain. So this is neurosurgery, drilling holes in the head and injecting the drug directly into the brain. But if it works, it'll be worth it. These are the results we've seen so far. The, the company that's furthest ahead with this is called Unicure. And what they've done is they've treated five-year-old pigs with HD. The pigs already had HD symptoms. They, inject, they treated them with this drug, and they showed that they were able to reduce the level of the Huntington protein by around about 50%, which is actually pretty impressive, considering that it's a tiny injection given deep into the brain. Um, that company has now uh, just announced the design of its first human trial. It was announced just a couple of months ago. Um, it's happening. I won't read through this in, in detail because it's actually uh, nor this, um, except there's something funny. Here we are. This is done by drilling two to six small holes in the skull. Now, if I'm talking about my skull, I don't think there's such a thing as a small hole. <laughs> Any hole is a big hole if it's going in my skull. Anyway, um, this study's happening in the USA. Uh, but that's fine, because uh, let the Americans test it. Let them have small holes drilled in their skulls. Um, see what happens. If it works, we'll be able to do it here as well. Um, the next step, in terms of new ways to explore the space of the inside the skull is this concept of small molecule drugs. So this is basically the idea of a drug that can be taken in the form of a pill. It won't be that big, that's huge. It'll be this big. Um, so uh, th the same sort of thing could be accomplished by little molecules that you could, you could either take as an injection into the blood or take as a pill. The, the downside is that it's mu with this kind of drug, it's harder to be very specific to the Huntington gene. So there's more risk that you might end up messing with other genes. But as long as it produces more good than harm, that may well be something that is very appealing. What I, the way I see this developing is that we could be giving people a combination of these drugs in a few years. So as early as we can, we give them the viral gene therapy injection, and then we give them a top up through a pill, and then if things are spiraling out of control, we can start using the injections into the spine, that kind of thing. It's a bit like what happens with diabetes or HIV, you know, combinations of different drugs. And what's great is that all of these approaches are being explored. We've got the ASO, which is being injected into the spine. We've got the viral gene therapy, several trials being planned, and the small molecule drug. And now exciting announcements about new uh, small molecule programs coming soon. So the next one then is the green one. That's the one that Dr. Stephen Strange has, and it is the time stone. So this is about the time, how, how time is ticking in the lives of everyone from an HD family. And what you all have noticed is that all of the trials that I've been talking about have been happening in people with symptoms of HD already. Okay, so this sort of early HD population where they've started to develop symptoms, but they're not very disabled. So the question then obviously is, well, what about later in the disease? Will the drugs work there? Or what about people who are too old to be in the current trials? And crucially, can we go back into the early life of our family members and give them a treatment that will prevent the onset of HD? These are not questions that the, any of these scientists or drug companies have forgotten. The reason all of the trials are happening here is because that's the population where you can most easily demonstrate that whether your drug is working or not. 
get a license, and then expand the trials once uh, the drug is being prescribed to, um, or indeed before then, to um, treat uh, across the whole range of the disease. And a big thing that's happening here is that this um, entity called the Critical Path Institute, for the first time, is bringing together HD scientists and drug companies with the FDA, um, which is the uh, agency in the USA that licenses drugs, and basically saying to them, okay, we need to plan ahead now how we're going to do these prevention trials, um, and basically getting the FDA on board early in the process so that when we are actually ready to run these trials, which I think will be in the next year or two, um, we'll, we'll have the FDA and the regulators signed on. So that's the time element. The next one, oh, I didn't do a quiz. It's the reality stone. It's the red one. This is important. So the reality stone gives the user the ability to change reality. But I'm using it to mean that we need to have a reality check. It's the reality check stone. Um, what will these treatments really mean? Best case scenario, worst case scenario. This is unquestionably the most exciting time there's ever been in HD. But I don't want to give you the impression that any of this is guaranteed or that any of it's going to be easy. The trials are designed to test whether the drug works or not. The trial is not designed to give a treatment that works to a particular patient who really needs it. In fact, it's the other way around. The people volunteering for these trials need to accept that the drug might harm them, and they are volunteering to take part in these trials in order to help other people. So it's a completely altruistic thing. Um, and there, you know, some people get placebo. Some people may experience side effects from the drug that are very unpleasant. Um, and that's the nature of these trials. With that in mind, um, you know, it, it becomes, I think, less of a disappointment. It should be less of a disappointment if you or your loved one is not personally able to take part in the trials, because the point is the drugs are going to get tested anyway. Like I say, this, this uh, phase three trial has been the fastest recruiting trial, and all we have to do is wait for the answers to come out of the trial. The other thing is all of these trials are pretty arduous, okay? We may have halved the number of needles that go into your spine, but um, it's still um, 13 lumbar punctures over the course of two years, which is a lot. And the viral ones are literally letting a guy you've only just met drill a hole in your head and stick pipes into your brain. So it's not straightforward. And again, with that in mind, maybe it's not such a bad thing to let other people test these drugs. Uh, that never stops, by the way, so I'll just move on. There's another thing, which is the inclusion criteria. So whenever uh, someone's being considered for a trial, they have to meet certain inclusion criteria. One of the ones that's been causing a lot of upset and confusion is this CAP score thing. It's worth knowing about this. Um, if you're ever sitting in a room with someone who uh, says you might be able to be in a clinical trial, it's this calculation that's based on the length of your CAG repeat, so the number that comes out of your HD genetic test, and how old you are. And for instance, in the Roche trial, you have to be I was going to say you have to be 400 years old. That's not right. You have to have a CAP score of 400. What that pans out to is this table. So if your, if your CAG count is 44, you'd have to be 38.68 years old in order to meet the criteria. If your CAP score is 50, you'd be, a, you'd be eligible at the age of 25. This is, this is the kind of thing that's making it very difficult for a lot of people personally to get in the trial. But again, the purpose of the trial isn't to get any individual treatment with the drug. The purpose of the trial is to test the drug more effectively, and this CAP score cutoff does achieve that, although it's caused a bit of confusion. So my basic message here in the reality stone is, if you want to be in a trial but haven't been able to, sit back and relax and let other people test the drug for you. The drugs are going to get tested anyway. Um, but that, you know, don't let that diminish your enthusiasm and do keep on top of what is happening um, in the trial landscape and in HD research in general. So what about when do we get the results and what will the results be? It seems to me that there are two possible outcomes which can be encompassed by the dancing lady emoji and the crying cat emoji. So the dancing lady represents a positive outcome of a trial. And we need to just brace ourselves for the fact that this might take four to five years to happen, and that's just the results of the trial. 
the crying cat emoji is a negative outcome. And actually, that can happen at any time. The company can do an analysis where they look at the data so far and just, and just conclude that the drug is not working or that the side effect profile is too bad or that there are too many complications happening and they can pull the plug at any time. This happened actually in an Alzheimer's trial. The, co the company did an early analysis, showed that the drug wasn't working. It's not the kind of drug we're testing. But there were people sitting in infusion chairs in our clinical trial center having infusions of the drug who literally had to stop the infusion and take the needle out of their arm because the trial had been terminated. That can happen. I hope it won't, and so far it's looking good, but it's just worth mentioning that good news takes a long time, negative news happens quickly. What this all means is no news is good news, right? If you haven't heard anything, it means it's all happening. But even, when, even if the trial is positive and the results come out and are announced, it'll take quite a while before the drug is available. And that's because it has to be licensed by things like the FDA and the European Medicines Agency. Um, I'm not gonna talk about Brexit, <laughs> but anyway, that will complicate things. NICE is then the company that decides whether the NHS will pay for people to receive the drug. If it works, I think they will, but NICE always introduces a delay while they contemplate and decide whether there's enough evidence that the drug works enough. And we've seen this time and time again, and it can be very frustrating. So what I'm saying is it could take a while, but we're not going to stop trying. So the NICE has approved the drug. The reality then is it's still got to be given by spinal injection. So we're going to need the infrastructure in the NHS to give these injections every couple of months, possibly indefinitely. Again, that's something to let other people worry about, but it could be one thing that causes challenges on the road ahead. What about if the trial is negative? What about if we get bad news? There are lots of reasons why a trial like this could fail, but the fact is we've had lots of negative trials before, over 100. We didn't just give up, we picked ourselves up, we made a better drug, and we tried again. And that's what got us into this situation where we're really optimistic about the current trial programs. If the trial is negative, we still have this. This is something that no one can ever take away from us. We, we know now that we can lower the concentration of the Huntington protein. If that doesn't slow progression, we can make it work in another way. Use a different drug, use a different trial design, test it earlier in the disease, test it in a different population, test it for longer, give it by a different route. There are many ways in which we can um, have another think. What, we, what I think that trial announcement is, is a new save point. You know, if you're working on a Word document, you save it, even if your computer dies, you can still go back to where you were. Previously, our save point in Huntington's disease was 1993 when the gene was discovered. But I think that December the 11th, 2017, Keith Chegwin's death day, was the new save point for the Huntington's disease community. That is the point, scientifically, that we can always go back to and try again. We don't have to go back to 1993 now to come up with a, uh, a way of turning bad news into good news. Okay, I feel like we're on the home straight. So um, the next stone is this yellow one. Now I can't remember what that one's called. Anyone? I think you're right, it's the mind stone. You've used the power of your mind to remember that this was the mind stone. Um, the mind stone, uh, I can't really, it's not really clear what the mind stone does. It sort of gives you the power to change the contents of other people's minds but also it's probably one of the most mysterious of the infinity stones. To my mind, the mind stone in HD is the idea of the minds of scientists who are still thinking about new ways to engage with this problem. So turning discoveries into treatments. And this is where we need to think again about the genetics of Huntington's disease. So this is someone's entire genome. This is all the DNA in one cell of a human body pulled apart and photographed on a microscope. And the Huntington's disease gene is here. It doesn't really look like that, but anyway, the DNA really looks like that, but the, it doesn't have a pink blob on it, or it would have been really easy to find. Um, this is the HD gene on chromosome four. And um, that was pretty much all we knew about the genetics of Huntington's disease until 2015, when the results of a big, big, big study were published. 4,000 HD family members gave their DNA through various studies, including in Roll HD, to this thing called the GemHD Consortium. And they ran what's called a genome-wide association study. It's basically looking at every single gene in the 
body and comparing little tiny genetic differences between people to find which of those differences make a difference to how old you are when your HD happens. So everyone in the study has the HD gene, but the question is, some people get HD earlier than expected, some people get it later than expected. And are there other genes elsewhere that are causing that? Because if there are, then studying those genes could give us new ideas about treatments. So um, what that study found was these two hotspots, one on chromosome 8 and one on chromosome 15. Some of them were slowing it down, some of them were speeding up the progression of HD. And then there was a second wave of this study involving 9,000 HD family members, DNA samples, which uncovered even more of these genetic modifiers all over the genome. And we'd never had such solid clues before to what other things are factoring in to the progression of HD. So that was really cool. But the really surprising thing was that almost all of these hits, as we call them, were in genes which themselves are recipes for making the machinery which repairs our DNA. So it feels like we're going around in circles. We're studying genes that, for a, to, to, that contribute to a disease we already know is genetic, and the new genes we found are genes that repair genes. Gets a bit confusing. What the upshot of this all is, is that DNA repair is a new and very uh, interesting field in, in Huntington's disease research. And the reason we know it's important is because these were real patients. Nature has already done the experiment that tells us that these genetic differences uh, in the DNA repair genes are making a difference to HD. And what it comes down to, we think, is this concept of somatic instability. So again, brace yourself for something that might slightly flip your worldview. You know that when you have an HD genetic test, a number comes out of it, and it's called the CAG repeat count. And you, you may be given that number. So typically something like 42. That's a bad result. Not great, not terrible, but it's, it's a positive, you know, i.e. it's a, a bad news result. And 42 is the number of CAGs in your blood, because that's where the blood test is done. However, in the brain cells of the person who has that repeat of 42, some of the brain cells do have 42 repeats, but we know that some of them have bigger repeats, 50, 60, or even more. We've never known why that is, but it's called somatic instability. That just means instability in the body. It's probably caused by something like this. Every day, because of stuff that happens, like radiation that comes from the sun, or you know, uh, oxidative toxins in your blood, your DNA gets damaged. So your CAG might have like four, C your DNA rather might have four CAGs here, but then it gets damaged. Along comes the DNA repair machinery, fixes the problem, but it makes a mistake, and it accidentally adds an extra CAG into your DNA. And if that happens too many times, you can end up with brain cells with way more CAGs. And those ones are going to be much more vulnerable to damage. So um, it, it looks like that, that whole area of DNA repair. And basically, what we'd be trying to do is make the cells better at repairing the DNA without adding extra CAGs. That could make a huge difference. And it could be something that would be instrumental in preventing or delaying the onset of HD. There was one other interesting finding from all of this genetic work, which was two big hits right in the neighborhood of the, of the Huntington gene itself. And we now know what was causing that. And it's basically this. So this is, uh, I can't remember how many CAGs, but this is a lot of CAGs. The truth of Huntington's disease is that actually most people have a CAA tucked in near the end of their CAG stretch. And we didn't think that was important because CAG tells a cell to, when it's making a protein, it tells a cell to add a building block called glutamine. CAA tells the cell the same thing. So from the protein point of view, this with CAG here is exactly the same as this with CAA here. What was weird, though, is that there are some people with two CAAs, and again, they're all, they're all going to put, glu put um, glutamines on the protein. People with two CAAs are really protected against onset, so they get onset much later than people with only one. 
And the people with no CAAs, which we call a pure CAG, tend to get onset of Huntington's disease earlier. The protein, like I say, the protein's the same in all three of these cases. So it must be some weird property of the DNA that is driving this difference. It's still a bit of a mystery. But what we know is that more CAA interruptions in your, in your gene produces later onset of the disease. And it probably comes back again to this idea of somatic instability. If you have more interruptions, it probably makes it easier for the DNA repair machinery to get a grasp on what's going on. You can imagine if your job is copying a huge page of text. If it's all CAG, 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 you, you could easily accidentally add an extra CAG. You could see how that would happen. But if there's a bit more variety in what you're copying, if there was an occasional CAA here and there, it'd be much easier to go back and count how many you'd done. You'd be less likely to make mistakes. And it seems that that's exactly what's happening at the level of DNA in Huntington's disease. It's not clear yet. Bottom line here is all of this genetic stuff has produced what are unquestionably the most promising new leads for drug development that we've had in a long time. New ideas, basically. The Mindstone, scientists and family members turning discoveries into treatments. So now this DNA repair thing, there are, there are literally new drug companies that have sprung up in the past year whose job is producing new drugs for Huntington's disease that focus on enhancing DNA repair and hopefully turning these genes that some people are lucky enough to have been born with into a pill that could work for everyone. And of course, as I've said, we know because these are real people in the world, some of them have been helped by their genes and some of them have been harmed by their genes, but Mother Nature has already done the experiment. All we need to do is produce a pill that mimics what nature has already done. 2018 was a big year for HD because it was also the first time that we knew uh, in proper resolution at the level of atoms what the Huntington protein looked like. And it looks like this. Um, it, what's weird is it has a big hole running through the middle of it. And nobody knows what goes in there. So everyone, for the, everyone at HD science meetings is running around like whispering to each other, what goes in the hole, what goes in the hole? It's slightly creepy, actually. Uh, we think it might be DNA, but we're not sure. The point here is that this has been a huge step forward because once you know the structure of something at the molecular level, you really start to develop an understanding of it. And you can start to develop, you can start to figure out what the different bits of the protein do, and you can start to figure out how you might be able to throw a drug at the protein and change the behavior of the protein. Okay, we're nearly there. The final stone then is what? Soul. Soul stone, absolutely. What color is it? It's orange. Who had the soul stone? Oh, it was on Vormir. Oh, spoiler alert. Yes, anyway. So the soul stone, it's about the soul. And it's about sacrifice, but we won't dwell on that. Um, my view here is that the, the global HD community is the soul stone that will help us complete the set and defeat Huntington's disease. Um, the HD community is completely unique because it is blended and joined together in a way that I've never met in any other disease. Um, Lauren Byrne, who is from a Northern Irish, big Northern Irish family, uh, she has Huntington's disease in her family. Her dad has HD. Uh, she has had a negative test, but has decided to devote her life to being a scientist. And she was the first scientist, the first staff member that I recruited uh, into my research team. Um, she's absolutely phenomenal. And it's partly because she has that personal uh, mission to make a difference. There are lots of people like that. And HD is a real community in which scientists and family members and prof health professionals are basically the same people. We're all one big HD family. Um, so the patient organizations bring people together and they talk to each other. And organizations like the European HD Network, HD Cope, HD Yo, and HD Buzz are sort of give, uniting the community and giving them from in different ways, giving, those, giving everyone in the community the resources that we will need 
to overcome this problem together. My mission to you, how to get into the Soul Stone, is to try and find a way to be in Enroll HD, which is more difficult in this room than in most places where I talk. It's not the hardest place in the world to be in Enroll HD. So there are some countries that have no Huntington's disease clinics. Or there are some countries that have HD clinics but no Enroll HD. Um, you guys have the challenge, I think, that you have a, one clinic that is in Dublin, right, that has Enroll HD up and running, but there's a huge waiting list. And there are other neurologists who see HD patients, but they don't have Enroll HD. My advice is really do what you can to help get Enroll HD up and running. It's a, it takes a long time, and you may have to set up an HD multidisciplinary clinic in Northern Ireland along the way. We know it can be done, and how we know it can be done is it's been done before. And it often takes many years, and it takes a lot of lobbying, lobbying of your politicians. And I know you guys don't really have politicians at the moment. So I guess the advice would be lobby your politicians to start doing their job. And once they're doing their job, lobby them to support the establishment of HD clinics. And then lobby those clinics to set up Enroll HD. And then volunteer for Enroll HD. It can happen. And it will only happen through people like you guys um, making it happen. And the fact that the goal seems very far away doesn't make the goal less worthwhile. In a sense, other people have set, have set out the path that is most likely to lead to success. Uh, and although it's a long and frustrating journey, and we all wish that you were, uh, everyone was further down, wherever you are on the journey, the thing to do is to keep moving forward. Um, if you get the chance, HD Clarity is a, is a multi-site study that I'm running, um, uh, which may at some point, hopefully, come to the island of Ireland, if not to the north. Um, and that's more or less everything I was going to say. The crucial thing here is that, you know, however we divide it up, whether we divide it into silly Avengers motifs or otherwise, there is a huge amount of resources coming from different angles that have given us the amazing position that we're in, where basically we have the six infinity stones, and what we need to do is use them uh, to keep making more progress and to not lose heart and to keep uh, supporting research and supporting each other. So the um, HD Avengers are not these gang of holly overpaid Hollywood actors. I have a, an image of the uh, Avengers here they are. It's you guys. Oh, it's not working. That's a shame. <laughs> I was going to show you. Oh, hang on. I can do this instead. I have a backup for when the video doesn't work. There they are, the HD Avengers. Um, cool. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you for your attention.